Discovering my purpose has been a forever evolving journey. But what I have found is that finding my peace and protecting that peace has been fundamental for staying on purpose, but also getting back on track. If you are someone out there who is looking to find your purpose or you know what your purpose is, but you're trying to find that peace for your purpose and to protect that peace, you do not want to miss this episode. Today, we're going to talk about all of those things and so much more right after this. What is mindset? Our mindset is based on what we believe and anything we believe in, we put into motion. I have spent my life putting the mindset of perseverance into motion. And now I am here today to share my journey along with others whose mindsets have changed the course of their lives. Hi, I'm mindset coach Lorraine Lindsay, and I believe that if you can change your mind, you have the power to change your life. So are you ready? Welcome back to another episode of the Lorraine Lindsay podcast. We are all about mindset here. This is where we believe that if you can change your mind, you have the power to change your life. And today we're going to talk about the mindset of purpose, discovering your purpose, and most importantly, protecting your peace in that discovery. Uh, I am super excited to have this guest. He's a very special guest, someone who um, I've admired for a very, very long time, who is very mindset driven, very purpose driven. Um, the one, the only Trent Shelton. Hi, Trent. Hey, hey. how you doing? I'm Thanks for having so me. Good. No, thank you for being here. I know that you're a very, very busy person and um, for you to take the time to be on the show means a lot to me in more ways than you can imagine. But um, before I get to talking to you and asking all the questions I've been wanting to ask you forever, let me give you all, for those of you who do not know Trent and should know Trent, let me just give you a little background on Mr. Shelton. So a little bit about Trent Shelton. He is a former American football wide receiver turned inspirational speaker, author, and founder of the Christian-based nonprofit organization Rehab Time. He was born and raised in Fort Worth, Texas. Shelton's childhood dream was to become a professional football player. He pursued his dream by playing college football for Baylor University. In 2007, Shelton's talent and dedication led him to being signed up by the Indianapolis Colts as an undrafted free agent. However, despite his efforts, he faced setbacks and challenges, including being cut from multiple NFL teams. These experience, experiences, excuse me, coupled with personal struggles, prompted Shelton to embark on a journey of self-discovery and transformation. In 2009, Shelton began documenting his progress of bettering his life through short two-minute videos. These videos became a platform for him to share his insights, struggles, and motivational messages, always ending with his signature phrase, it's rehab time. Through rehab time, Shelton aims to inspire individuals to overcome obstacles, find hope in difficult circumstances, and lead fulfilling lives. His powerful message of resilience, self-love, and personal growth has garnered a massive following on social media and has touched the lives of countless people worldwide. Today, Trent Shelton continues to use his platform to empower others through his books, speaking engagements, and online presence. His latest book, Protect Your Peace, offers practical tools and principles to help individuals reshape their mindset, find inner peace, and live with purpose. Shelton's journey with professional, um, from professional athlete to motivational speaker leader serves as a testament to the transformative power of perseverance, faith, and self-discovery. Wow. <laughs> Thank you again. That's awesome. Thanks for that intro. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, it's well-deserved. There's so much more I could say. Um, but I want to start with this, if I may, where I discovered you, where I first um, heard your first thing. And this is probably going back to about 2009. Yeah. I remember I was in a very low place in my life. I was feeling defeated. I was struggling with being a young single mother and just going through a lot of different things and just kind of in my head about it. And I was sitting at this local tavern, had ordered some food and there was a bartender who I was sipping and giving him my woes. And he says to me, you have to see this guy that I saw on, I want to say it was like either Facebook or YouTube at the time, because we didn't have the Instagram and all that stuff right. back then. And he plays me one of your videos. And I was like, who is this? And it was like, what you were saying was exactly what I needed to hear at that very moment. And I was like, Lorraine, put on your big girl pants. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's time to, it's rehab time. Like literally <laughs> it was that for me. And, um, and I just kind of fo like followed you and, and it was always an inspiration. But I was curious, and this is the one thing I mainly wanted to ask you was, 
at that time, there wasn't this followers and this big thing and all these gurus and people like that. You were genuinely coming from this authentic, but this in your face, like you were that person that told me the things nobody else would tell me. Yeah. But yet I still felt there was this like this level of love coming from it, for even sure. though it was like in your face. So what was that all about for you? What, what started this whole journey for you? Yeah, well, the in your face, I always say I like to go between a balance of challenge and comfort mm -hmm. because that's how I receive coaching or even talking to myself. So it started with me wanting to fix my own life. So mm -hmm. a lot of those videos were reminders to myself and what I found out that other people needed that also. Um, and the big catalyst was, you know, one of my best friends committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me, you know, really take this seriously. You know, um, my commitment to him was I'm going to live the rest of my life helping people know their self-worth. Mm -hmm. And for people listening to this and people who know me, it seems like, oh, duh, yeah, Trent. But if you ask anybody who knows me personally, like my father, he still trips out when I'm doing this because I would be the last pick out of his three sons to be doing what I'm doing. So it was a calling that found me mm. and I wasn't ready for it. I was scared. Like who am I to talk about how to change your life when I have so many things I want to change. But the mission of helping people uh, became bigger than any fear. Mm. How did you know? Did you know? Cause like, like you said, and this is interesting because when you first started doing this thing, it wasn't like, this is my purpose. This is my thing. Nah. Like you said, it was kind of like a thing for yourself. At what point in that journey or that you were doing this that you was like, maybe this might be my purpose, or did you know? I never knew until, I mean, yeah, the videos and people started following and things like that. And I started to realize like, wow, like everything I went through has a purpose. So that mm -hmm. was the main thing. Like realizing that my past pain had purpose, I always say it's other people's future strength. But the time that it became really real for me, I was actually doing my events. Um, it's funny because one of my first events was in Vegas. Oh, it was really? like in a, I don't even know where it was at. It was like in a school like room. And I would do these things called live conversations because okay. I didn't have money to <laughs> rent out a venue or anything like that. It was a donation based show up, maybe 10 people. But I was in Austin, Texas at a, at a club, actually. We mm -hmm. actually used the club during the daytime and I was doing live conversations. And after the event, two kids, teenagers came to me with tears in their eyes. And they said, Trent, like you saved my mom's life. Mm. And I was like, no, I didn't save her life. Like I might've been a vessel. She had to do the work, but uh, she's like, no, you really saved her life. And the mother came up and was crying. She said, and I still remember this video. She said, it was like 3 a.m. in the morning and I was getting on Facebook to say my goodbyes, literally. Mm. And your video popped up. And the video was, if you're thinking about killing yourself, don't do it. Wow. And so that was the moment for me where I said, okay, this is, bigger than any plan, anything I can envision. Like this is a true calling and purpose that's been put on my life. So my question then is like, wow, it's so powerful. And I'm gonna, I'm trying to phrase the questions where I'm not being selfish in the questions because a lot of the things that you're saying just resonates with me so much. And I think a lot of people, when they're thinking about their purpose, they think that it has to be this big grandiose thing and it has to <laughs> appear that way right away. But here you are, saying, you know, at this time I wasn't venues and books and things like that. And we'll talk about that, but you literally just, you showed up at a, a thing. So what was it from posting a video to saying, let me do this live call thing. Like yeah. wh how did we get to that next step for you? Really? It was, so rehab time was me trying to get myself together to make it back to the NFL. Okay. That's why rehab time started. It okay. wasn't to be a speaker. Rehab time meant, I, I don't know if it was Rihanna's song at the time, checking the rehab, but <laughs> it was in my head like rehab time. That meant going to the gym. That meant mindset stuff. I wasn't reading books at all. I always mm -hmm. say like Lil Wayne was probably my personal development mentor <laughs> at that time in my life. <laughs> That's hilarious. And getting my soul right. Mm. And so I started there and I would go to the gym, 24 hour fitness, and it would be like 12 a.m. We called the 12 a.m. club. We would be in there. And at that time, it was a streaming service called either Ustream or yeah, Ustream. And so I would stream on my laptop while I was working out, and people would ask questions. And I would give them, you know, responses, blah, blah, blah. And they kept saying, hey, come back tomorrow. So it got to a point where I couldn't keep coming back. So I said, you know what? Let me make these videos and put them on YouTube. Interesting. And so I started making the videos on YouTube, and that's when, you know, kind of the whole process started. So it started there. And so it was the feedback from other people mm -hmm. to let me know that I had something worth giving to the world 
that built the confidence inside me. Interesting. Wow, that's so crazy because I think about people that I've interviewed and I've talked to, and especially people who are really purpose driven, that like they were literally on their purpose and how, and again, this is so good for people to hear, to know that it just starts with one little thing that you just get this little itch and kind of thing and you, and you act on it. Yeah. And then that thing leads to another thing. Because a lot of times people will say, well, where do I start? Like, I think I know what my purpose is, or I don't know what my purpose is, but where do I start? So where would somebody in their life who feels like they don't really know purpose, where do they, where would they extract that from in your, in your opinion? I would tell them first, stop searching for it. Mm, love that. I wrote this in my book, The Greatest You. Um, and this is a quote that always sticks with people. And I tell people, purpose is not something you search for, it's who you are. Mm. A lot of us, we try to find purpose in this world. We try to find purpose in the job. And that's not your purpose. Mm. That's your placement. That's where your life is supposed to be at, at that time. I thought football was my purpose. When I lost it, I felt no purpose in my life. And so what I decided to say, you know what? I'm purpose. Mm. I was born on purpose, for a purpose, to do purpose, to breathe purpose, to share purpose. So I can take my life anywhere and make it better. And so that's what I learned how to do now when it comes to placement, knowing that, okay, or you're in the season for your life or your calling, you know, that ties to a few things, you know, mm -hmm. um, I always say your past is one of them. The things that you went through qualifies you to help other people get through it. Absolutely. You become the guide for other people. So the analogy I love to use is, would you take um, a map from somebody who's never hiked the trail before? You wouldn't. So I would take a map from somebody that I know has hiked the trail that's mm. been through what I've been through. And so that qualifies you. Your past doesn't disqualify you. It qualifies you. Another part is your power. You know, mm. what do you feel powerful about? Where do you feel hungry to solve problems? What are things in the world, if you had a million dollars, all the money in the world, you would change? And for me at that time, I wanted to help people know their self-worth. Mm. I wanted to take away those suicidal thoughts for people. And so that was an indicator that this is where my life is best used in this season it's also where your your best friend's legacy lives too absolutely right it's interesting you say that because i remember for me i was uh i went to school to be a medic i was a medic and an emt in this town for 10 years and then i went to nursing school and i always felt that i had this call in my life to help and heal and i thought that that pathway was through medicine and so I remember getting into the nursing program and thinking, okay, well, I'm a single mom. I can't really afford, you know, big medical school. I'd love to have gone to school to be a doctor, but I just couldn't do it. Right. So nursing was the next best thing for me. And it was as smart as I was, as skilled as I was, I kept getting these setbacks and these roadblocks that was literally like failing me out of the program. And there were circumstances that were beyond my control. It was like, thinking to myself, how is it that I know that this is the thing I'm supposed to do? Yeah. And yet this is not what's happening for me and really falling and finally just having no other avenue and, and asking God, like, why? I want to help people. I want to do this. Why? And I was working at this job at the time and there was a woman there that was always talking to people and she had this kind of teacher essence about her. And I remember saying to her, or she, excuse me, she was talking and I said to her, you know, Judith, why aren't you a teacher somewhere? And she started laughing and she said, um, I was a teacher in a school and I hated it. And she's like, and what I've learned is that you don't have to do your gift quite literally. And it was in that moment that it was like God speaking to me. And I understood then that maybe I feel the essence and that purpose that's calling on me is to help and heal. But what I realized is it wasn't through medicine. I had to find another way. And you were on the, uh, you had an interview with Ed Milet. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this off camera. And you said this quote. And it really resonated me because of what I just shared with you, because of letting that thing go. And this is what you said on his show. You said this. And I don't know if you remember this or not. But you said, there are often times when people are placing calls on you and letting you know, but when you're so locked in to what you want to do, mm -hmm. you become deaf and blind to what you are called to do. Yeah. And that was so me, and I think that's a lot of people out there who are seeking purpose, is they get so locked in to that thing, that outside thing. For you, it was football. For me, it was a, being a nurse or a doctor. And thinking that has to be it, that I was so laser focused on it not working out, 
that I wasn't seeing, I wasn't hearing really where that could go and be greater than myself. So do you feel like that's, I mean, when you said that, I was like, that is 100%. I think a lot of people get trapped in that. Um, also with purpose, I think, especially when you're doing motivation and speaking and, and inspiring people, I think a lot of people think that their purpose has to be somehow rooted in past pain. Do you yeah. think that that's true? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be there as far as like you went through something to help people get through it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be there. You know, um, sometimes, you know, even kind of speaking to what you're saying with, with callings and, 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 and even purpose in your life, I know for myself, like I want to do what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and I never want to do this. I resisted it. I, I tell people all the time, this is not something I sought out to do. I didn't go to Toastmasters. I didn't take <laughs> classes, anything like I'm an introvert by nature. Are and, you? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And um, this is not something that I wanted to do. I get it's so funny because people who who know me through rehab time are like, wow, you're introvert. And people who know me before rehab time are like, wow, I can't believe that you're doing this. Interesting. You know, um, but as you were saying, it's kind of like what you're calling and purpose, like, or just even the thing that you're called to do in your life. It's kind of like, have you ever like searched for something so hard that you overlook it and it's like right in front of right, your face? Right. Yes, absolutely. Or your keys are in your pocket, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, or you might have a pin you're looking for, it's in your ear. And I felt like, a lot of people are doing that. They're working so hard and don't get me wrong. I believe in hard work, but sometimes you're working so hard to become something. If you just learn how to let go and release and allow it to come naturally. Like I'm not saying this is easy for me, right? but it definitely was easier than any other thing I did in my life because I'm actually called to do it. Mm. But I had to pick up the phone and actually answer the call. Mm. Cause so many times I'm sending it to voicemail. It's kind of like, you ever owe somebody something mm -hmm. and they're calling you and you're like, nah, I ain't about to talk to them. <laughs> so I felt like the same thing with, with God in my life. I yeah. was like, nah, I'm not ready. I'm not perfect enough. Who am I? I don't look like the standard X, Y, Z. And it really took me just find the courage to say, you know what? I'm going to pick up the call flawed and all. And I'm going to show people this journey of progression. You know, it's so powerful. You say that it resonates with me so much because I, um, I, I mean, when you're the, the hardest part, is actually answering the call, That's it. right? Being obedient to it. That's right. Um, I can't remember who it is biblically, but the, the, he talked about the thorn in his side. Yeah. And and we, we never knew what that thorn was, but it's almost like your call. That's right. It just, I mean, there are times when I want to run away from it. There are times when I'm overwhelmed by uh, what what this thing is, and there and the thing is when I even put my toe in it a little bit. It'll, it gets traction. And then I, and then I find myself sometimes retreating and that whole thing, that imposter syndrome of, am I good enough? Um, you know, what if people laugh at me? Um, I kind of want to also, I, I don't want to jump around too much, but this huh. segue would be a good segue to talk about your next book, which is the protecting your peace. And you yeah. have nine principles to that. And yep. you posted something recently. And I think this is a good segue. Um, and one of those principles, and I want you to touch on it. It was about, the vision of the, the having the vision and that strangers sometimes will adopt the vision more than people in your own tribe. And it made me think about, you know, I'm a spiritual woman. I was, I was I'm a Christian woman. And so I remember learning in the Bible at one point when Jesus went back to where he was from and people only saw him as the carpenter's son. Yeah. And yet this incredible, you know, son of God couldn't heal, wasn't healing because people didn't believe they didn't have the faith. And so what I felt like by no comparison to Jesus, by no means, but like, you know, I have this thing and it's a thorn in my side and it t makes me toss and turn sometimes. And I feel so incredibly responsible to it. But yet when I, when I was in my tribe, as things started to kind of evolve, um, feeling laughed at almost, or that people were rooting for me when I was rock bottom, but then when they thought there was this perception of success, kind of turning their back. And you kind of talked about that a little bit. So can you kind of touch on that as one of the principles for protecting your peace? Yeah, we could talk on this for an hour on this one, man. This is so, this hit hard. Yeah, so the first thing I want to tell you is, um, anybody listening to this, like some people are too close to you to see your greatness. Mm. And what happens is, is they get desensitized. Anything you're familiar with, you get desensitized to it. So mm -hmm. they've been around you your whole entire life. You're just such and such from middle school. You're just, oh, that's my niece or that's my daughter. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong. It's just that some people, I think all people will never see the vision that God put in your life mm -hmm. until you actually 
make it come to life. And so the quote that I love to say is, God will place strange in your life to take you to higher places. Mm. So don't be surprised when your support doesn't come from familiar faces. Mm. That's so good. And it's true. Like, if you think about any big company in the world, they're made up of strangers. Even if all their family supports them, you need strangers to take it to the next that level. That's so true. If 10, 20, 30 people support you and your family, that's great, but you still need strangers. Mm. And so I tell people, I know you want their support, but you don't need their support. I know it hurts when they don't support, but you don't need their support to keep going. And so your family is those that need your message, those that are waiting for you to give your gift to the world. Like there's literally people out there waiting for you to mm -hmm. show up and you're allowing somebody, and I'm. it sounds kind of rude, but small mindsets can't comprehend big visions. That's right. You know, you can't expect a person that's not a dreamer to understand a dream. Right. You can't expect a person that's not a visionary to understand a vision. And so when you look around your family, you got to ask yourself, like, they've never done this before. They've never been successful. So what do they do? They vomit their impossibilities on you. Absolutely. They project their fears on you. And so you can't take it personal. You got to realize, oh, okay, that's just a them thing. So let me go ahead and go on this journey. I know I want people with me. Right. Some people might fall off. Some people might stay back. But as you continue to progress, you will see from strangers like, oh, okay, this is special. And then they'll come around mm -hmm. once you make it happen. And then it's like, oh, okay. You know, so that's so liberating. And I hope people really, really hear that because I think sometimes we stay stuck waiting for certain people to give us the approval. Yeah. And some of those people are near and dear to us sure. and their intentions are great. But like you said, they just can't see the forest from the tree, so to speak, right? Yeah. They just they don't they they don't have the capacity within themselves to see what what is in front of you, and I just think that that is so fundamental. If people could just get that, you know, is to see that the like for me, I've learned, and I and I actually have a question about this, is to not. I used to get really caught up in surrounding myself with like minded people, but then I had to say, well, where am I? Right. in that in that environment when i say like mine i can get trapped in that spot if i'm not moving and if they're not moving and we can have a lot of the same conversations you know but also learning to be comfortable in rooms where people are smarter than me or that where i met strangers who said i see that potential and i'm going to put that potential to work and maybe mean being ready to do the work um so speaking of that and tribe and village and things like that how important is it um to remove or to separate yourself from environments that are toxic. Cause again, and then uh, I think it was the ed, uh, one of the interviews you did, you talked about the seed and cultivating the seed. And you were saying like, you know, if your seed is in toxic fuel, yeah. it's not gonna bear the fruit that you are as plentiful. It just won't grow the fruit. Yeah. And so talk about that and how imperative that is for people to, um, be in environments where their seeds can grow and how peace plays a part of that. Absolutely. Um, I love to tell people a great seed and toxic soil will not produce a beautiful harvest. It won't. And so you have to check your soil. Mm -hmm. And I know that's the hardest thing to do, especially when it's people that you love and you care about. Mm -hmm. But you got to understand that some people are good, but they're not good for the current season and journey that mm -hmm. you're on. And mindsets are very contagious. So the thing that I ask myself, because I say this and people kind of look at me sideways, but I've learned to not be loyal to people, to be loyal to my principles. Mm, I love that. Expound because, on that. Yeah, loyalty can sometimes be your slavery. You mm. can be loyal to a bad situation. You can be loyal to something that's not right for your life because mm -hmm. you're so loyal, because you have such a good heart. And that's the perfect recipe to stay in something that's toxic and right. break your heart. And so for me, I'm loyal to my principles. My principles are the things that guide my life. Mm. My principles I know will protect my life. So when I want to say yes, my principles are saying no. When I want to say another chance, my principles are saying no. And the times I ignore my principles, I put myself in terrible situations. And so I would ask the person listening to this, like, what are your principles? What are the things that you stand on? What are the things that can make the decision for you? Because your human self will always go back and default to your loneliness, to your insecurities, right. and put yourself right. back in those situations again. So principles, I always tell people, people laugh, but I said, hey, I'm not telling you no, my principles are. I really want to tell you yes, but the way my principles are set that. up, I can't do it. So how does someone go about really tapping into principles and yeah. really being able to say, you know what, I'm just realizing as I'm hearing him say this, that I don't have any established principles. How do they start getting those and, and really uh, 
like making them actionable for their lives. Because here's one of the things that I've learned with coaching people sometimes is that I can tell them the tips, the tools, everything like right. that, right? Here, here it is, do right. these things. <laughs> and yet they don't, they don't move, they don't take action. They're so tied into the drama, the stories, the, uh, the pathology, that yeah. it becomes such an identity construct for them that they don't know how to say, oh my goodness, I, these principles, these core values, how does someone root themselves and create those for themselves? Yeah, like to a person that's not taking action, I always use healthy fear. And I tell them, listen, if you stay in a situation, if you're complaining that you're unhappy, then you're going to die unhappy if you don't change anything. Mm. So I put the reality right in front of their face, and that's their decision because you can't make a person change that doesn't want to change. Right. So that's rule number one. Uh, when it comes to principles, I've often asked myself, like, what's the life that I want to live, right? What's the life that I want to be remembered by? Mm. Um, how do I want people to treat me? How do I want to treat people? So one of my main principles is, this came from my grandmother, leave everything better than how you found it. And so no matter what I'm around, no matter what I'm doing, that. I'm going to leave it better than how I found it. If I go through the drive through at Starbucks, I want to make that person's day a little bit better by just giving them a compliment. Mm. Another principle of mine is biblically, love thy neighbor as you love thyself. Mm. And the truth is about that, some of us don't love ourselves, so we can't love our neighbor. That's so true. That's facts. So it starts with yourself. And so these are some of my principles that I know that will keep me in my place of peace. So for everybody else, it's different obviously family first and all these other things, but it's like, what do you need for your life that will help you move forward efficiently and also protect your energy, protect your mind and protect your soul? What is that for you? Like, what's the bridge that you need to build that will lead you to a greater you? And everybody else is different, but mm. you gotta get clear about that. But first step is burning some bridges. Mm. You know, people say don't burn bridges, I've burned bridges. I've burned I disagree. Boats. I put myself on an island all by myself. <laughs> I've had to. There's certain bridges you shouldn't burn yeah. for sure over little things and yeah. petty stuff, but there's certain bridges you have to burn because there's certain things your life cannot afford to go back, back to. to. Yeah. Right. So how does somebody, cause I, you know, I've, I, and I, 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 so like I'm there, I've done that. I've, I've done those things of literally doing some human inventory and saying, yeah. look, I love you, but it's not like you said about the seasons and things yeah. like that. But for a person, because this is some of the feed, the kickback I get from people sometimes is, all right, easy for you to say you've established yourself to get out of that toxic environment. I, I can't afford to leave the toxic environment, or I can't this, or they've got these, a, these, these reasons why they're saying they can't. I can't get rid of the toxic person because that's my mom, or it's someone super close to me, or it's my husband, and I got kids. How does somebody create an environment? for themselves, for their peace, when they're kind of so, so to speak, stuck in toxic environments. Yeah, I think I can't is a prison perspective. Mm. You can, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna suck, it's not gonna right. feel good, but you can, but you just don't wanna go through. See, I talk about this in the book. A lot of us don't set boundaries because of two reasons, worry and guilt. Mm. Worry, we worry about what that person's gonna say, we worry about the repercussions or the guilt that I'm leaving this person behind or I'm turning my back. And when you don't set boundaries in your life, there's no way you can experience peace in your life. Mm. So what boundaries do you need to set? And so for me, I'm also telling myself this, like in order for me to be the best me for those that need me to be, I got to make sure that I release myself from things that are causing stress, mm -hmm. that's keeping me a shell of myself. Like my kids need me to be, the, me, need me to be my best self. Right. So it is, if it is my kids, which sometimes it is with them, <laughs> but, if you can't change the situation, you got to change your mindset towards it. Absolutely. And that takes work and it's tough. But if you're staying in the situation, you got to say, okay, well, how can I bring purpose to the situation? How can I not let this situation affect me? How can I remind myself that it's a them thing and not a me thing? Right. And you got to get clear on that. And, and, and almost like what I'm hearing is make that a principle for yourself. For sure. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, circumstances are going to happen. Anticipate the thing is one of the things I always tell people. It's like, let's play out worst case. Yeah. If you can get it, if you can get rooted in the fact that life is going to throw things at you, then you can decide what the behaviors you're going to attach to it. Instead of being blindsided by the inevitable, you know, like pain is inevitable. You know, I think Tony Robbins talks about the suffering versus pain. It's yeah. like anticipate the problems. So that way you can be rooted in how you're going to respond to those problems. You know, let's play that out. You, um, for you, I, your book actually, uh, you can pre-order it, it's coming out in March. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wasn't sure if it was intentional for you, um, the date that you have, because I know that a few years ago, 
the month of March was a, mar uh, a month of hell for you. Mm -hmm. um, you went through so much. You gained angels. I know you don't like to say losses, but right. you gained your angels. Your mother had passed away. And then two days later, you ha your daughter has a, a traumatic brain injury yeah. and is an ICU. Mm -hmm. And then while you're there, you get a call that your grandmother's in ICU. Yeah. And, lo and you gained your angel two weeks from that point. In a, in a situation like that, where it's just everything unimaginable is coming at you at the same time, the same time, how did you, or maybe, I don't know if you, you were able to at that time, really be able to protect your peace in that? Where did you draw strength in that moment when at that time, for me, it'd be like I'd be losing it all, that vulnerability, that helplessness, all at the same time. What was that for you? And is that why your book releases in March? So to answer that question first, um, no. Okay. Well, no, that wasn't the intent. The book was actually supposed to come out in January. Okay. But I felt we wasn't ready to put it out. And the book publisher said, okay, the only day we can put it out is March 5th. I said, all right, without even thinking about it. Wow. And then as I sat there a day or so, I said, man, like that's the week, March 5th. But what's even more powerful um, is that's the last time I see my mother alive was March 5th. Wow. And the book is dedicated to her. So I'm like, yeah. That's she's, Angel right there. Absolutely. Wow. Um, and during that season, it was hard for me to find peace. Mm. Um, it was a point of like, you realize nothing else matters. Mm. And it's something I preach so much to people. I know the things. I know the the followers. I know the money. Like, I'm not telling you, you don't go get those things right. and have those things, but it will never be enough to cure your soul mm -hmm. when the pain is deep. Like there was no amount of followers that <laughs> could take my tears away. Right. No amount of money I could buy to, to bring me peace. And so at that moment, I realized like what life is truly about. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's about creating moments that turn into memories. When my daughter was laying there, literally like, man, it's so hard to talk about that, but fearing I'm gonna lose her, um, nothing else matter. Mm -hmm. My plea to God was take it all. I don't need anything. Just make sure my baby girl is okay. And then with my grandmother, you know, it's just like, man, what's going on in my life? Yeah. And seeing my mother, I know some people can relate to this, but, uh, you know, get wheeled out of the house on that stretcher and you look and you realize that that's done. There's no more memories that could be made. It makes you really prioritize your life mm. and see what matters. And I'm going to tell people this, and some people may disagree, but from a person that's experienced a lot in life, has seen the best of the best, at the end of the day, what matters is doing what you love with who you love. Mm. That's what matters. Yeah. And that's fulfillment, and that's peace in your life. If I ask somebody right now, would you want a million dollars to have peace? They would say peace. A million followers have peace, peace. So why don't we prioritize our peace? Why yeah. don't we put everything in front of our peace in life? Why do you think that is? Because it's it's society's pressure on us mm. to always chase more. And chasing things is exhausting. It is. Like, I can truthfully say, I didn't chase this. I always say you strengthen your magnet. When you have a magnet inside you, it attracts. I love that. You know, this interview, you didn't chase this interview. No. It happened. I know. It's so wild. It's so crazy you say that. I was thinking about that today. You know, like, wow, um, I've been watching him for so long and you've been, you know, we've had a couple different correspondence and you've been so gracious in that. And um, and then you're like, hey, I'm coming to Vegas. And I was like, wow, you know, and, and it's the timing of it. And I don't want to get emotional. It's just that I was at, I've been at a point where I'm like, am I supposed to be doing this? You know, like, am I saying the right things? Am I putting out the right content? Because, because I didn't think about it before. Do you know what I mean? I was kind of like what you said. I was just feeling certain things, going through certain things and thinking, I've learned something here. This mindset shift, this changing my mind, taking these courses, doing the work, it's changed my life. And I'm thinking I was that little girl in that homeless shelter in a battered environment and just all this. I had a parent who I lost a parent to suicide mm -hmm. and thinking and I was on my own at 16 you know I was a mother at 17 and I wasn't supposed to make it and the environment that I was in at the time supported that but me having my son was like that paradigm shift 
And when I look back and think to myself, like, how did I make it? How did I? It was this knowing. It was this yeah. this thing inside of me that said, for him and for you. And I had nothing to give my son, but I'm like, I got to give him peace of mind. And I got to give him back to God. That was the first thing I did when I gave birth to him. And just shifting my mind, changing my environment. And like you said earlier, when people say I can't and making excuses, I force my way out. That's right. I found ways if I had to listen to something online or find a book to read until I could meet a person who could have just a different conversation. I was so hungry for it. I didn't know where it was going to lead me or where it was going to take me, but I knew that every new environment, every new conversation I had shifted me just a little, a little, a little. And, um, and, and then I just got to a point where I started feeling defeated. Like I was like, I don't, know if anything's compelling anymore yeah and it's crazy because you you send the message and i was like all right god he i have watched you and i've seen i i feel like sometimes when i watch you and i see you post it's almost like there are times when i'm like oh is he is he going through something mm -hmm. right now you know is there something going on with him but you're so transparent and so real yeah. how important is that for you because i feel like you are so consistent and so authentic yeah it's too hard to be something else Mm. I realized that like it's easy to be me it's easy to share what I'm going through mm -hmm. um one of the quotes that I live by is your transparency will be your transformation mm. as well as for other people and I realize people need to see that real they need to see a model of real to see oh I'm not alone mm -hmm. I'm going through this and it doesn't take away from your brand doesn't take away from your expertise because you're going through things. I think it adds to it. I agree. It makes you more relatable. People mm -hmm. can see themselves in you because it's easy to inspire people with things. Mm -hmm. You know, I could show all the things you can be inspired by, and that's great. But I believe the only way to transform people is to let people in so they can see themselves in, in you and say, oh, okay, they've been there before, so I can, I can get out of my situation too. Yeah. And so I am loyal to that and i made a promise and a commitment to myself when i first got in this space that i'm not trying to be perfect i'm just trying to be real mm. and sometimes maybe that's wrong sometimes it's right i don't think but so. i want to be honest to what i'm going through because i want even my pain to help you heal a little bit and so it's just easier for me not to be in my head and trying to think about things to say and just come from my heart yeah and you do i mean it is felt it is the sincerity is definitely felt so what was it for you? I'm circling back here mm -hmm. to the time when you didn't have your peace, when you were distraught and going through things. I mean, you, you, you've you been able to write a book. Yeah. yeah it's a testimony, <laughs> right? But sure. what was it? I mean, how did you get your head above the water? What Was there a moment or was there like a, a combination of things that finally said, okay, I got I to gotta now forge ahead? Yeah, you know, I had to heal. Mm. I realized like who I am to the world, right? I realized that I didn't give myself proper time to grieve. Mm. I thought I did, but I didn't because I had to be this person to everybody else. I still had to take care of people. I still had to, you know, be a man and be strong. And I realized like, especially with men, I, I know women deal with this too, but as a man, we think uh, strength is shown in how much you can carry. Mm. And I believe strength is also shown how much you can let go of. So it's a lot of things I had to let go of in my life and a lot of pressure. Like one of them was a promise to my mom that I made to her. You had to let it go, you said? I had to. Do you because mind Because that sharing? promise, yeah, absolutely. That promise was, I got everybody, mom. You can mm. rest in peace. It's on me. I'm going to take care of everybody. And I didn't want to break that promise. But in having that promise, I put a lot of unnecessary pressure that on my was, life. Yeah. Uh, trying to make sure everybody was straight and I was losing myself. And so I know my mother wouldn't want that. So I had to let go of that and say, you know what? I'm doing my best to be there for people. I can't change people. I got to get people over to God mm -hmm. and I got to take care of me. And so it, folk, it, the peace came from a lot of solitude. I'm a nature lover. So I feel like it's God's natural medicine for the soul. Mm -hmm. So I'm hiking, I'm talking to God and I'm figuring out, you know, through reflective therapy, as I call it, just reflecting on my life and figuring out like, what do I need? What do I want in this next season of my life? What are the strongholds on my life right now? Mm. Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to get around? And asking these questions helped me build a strong environment around me through people and through even things that I listen to and watch. 
I love that you said the thing about solitude. Yeah. Because I feel like people are afraid of it. Um, you know, they, they having this idle mind and letting it just kind of run away with you. And I, you know, I try to tell people there's a difference be- between the mindset of loneliness and being alone. Yeah. And I do find that a big part of me and my peace is, is having solitude, is having that moment where I can hear God and speak to God and just be still and know, you know what I mean? And I find like that's been incredibly powerful, just being able to get rid of some of the noise, you know, and kind of re, reshifting myself. Do you do that kind of thing also when it comes to your principles? Or do you say, these are my principles, this is it? Or does life tell you, all right, maybe this was it, maybe I need to change it to this? Absolutely. Do you give yourself the grace to change some of those fundamental principles? I flow principles? with life. Yeah. I flow with I life. I, I have some principles that will never change. Okay. But I flow with life in the season of my life and what I need to be in that season because life is ever changing for me. You know, I have kids that are growing. I have a family. I have uh, a business that's growing. So... That's always going to change. You know, right. I can't always keep the same ways or the same habits that are outdated. So I always have to update uh, my principles and my habits and my right. routines. I tell people, some people will say to me, you know, I um, I really need to change my ways or I need to change yeah. who I am. And I always say to them, well, do you really need to change or is it just you need to cultivate? That's right. Right. Because the essence of you and I always use the um, example of an apple seed. The seed is the seed is the seed is always going to be an apple seed. It can't be a mustard seed or an oak, you know? So it's like, if you know who you are at the essence of who you are, you just need to know what stage of cultivation you're in and it will naturally organically change, but it will always be at the essence who it is. So are you a sprout? Are you a tree? Are you a fruit or are you an orchard? And you just need to know what season of your life, like you talk about, and what you need to cultivate because an an orchard requires something very different than the sprout does. That's true. And um, and just getting people to see that because people are so obsessed with the, their idea that they need to change. And I feel like um, a lot of the media and the social media and stuff like that put that kind of pressure. Do you, even though social media is a big part of your business, yeah. do you feel like the social media is uh, disturbing the peace for people. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and how do people per, protect their peace? hundred percent. hundred percent. How do I'm, you protect your peace with that? I'm rarely on there. Like people think I'm on there all the time. Yeah. Um, it is me respond. I do have a team, but it's mostly me, but I set limits with that. Like, um, I'm not on there browsing. Sometimes I am, but most times I'm not on there browsing and giving my thumb exercise. I'm literally on there to live purpose <laughs> and do purpose and just try to do my part and get off of there because it can, you know, we live in a world full of information. Mm. Like we're in information overload. And a lot of us, we have information overload, but no output of action. Absolutely. And so it's just like all these things coming, but we're not actually acting on these things. And so for me, you know, having a healthy relationship with it, for sure. I mean, it changed my life, but it's a tool. Mm. It's how you use it, right? Is it using you or are you using it? Mm. And I, I think it's that. a powerful tool either way. So I've learned how to set boundaries with it for sure. So what are your um, nine principles for protecting your peace? Yeah, so let me make sure I get all these. <laughs> so protect your protect your energy, right? That's the first section. Okay, let's talk about that because that's important. Yeah, so, the, so principle number one is set boundaries. Okay. And we kind of touched on setting boundaries and why it's important. Um, if you're not, if you have any, this is what I'll tell people too. You have to clearly communicate your boundaries because we have a lack of maturity sometimes in our communication we want people to respect the boundary that we don't even, they don't even know it's set. Mm. So you can't have unclear communication and expect fair expectations of somebody. Mm. It's unfair to them. So yeah. clearly communicate your boundaries and why you're setting the boundary. Um, the second principle is disconnect often. Mm. And that's kind of what we talked about. Sometimes that's in nature, but also this idea of disconnecting from what's controlling your pace. One thing that's helped my life with peace is being loyal to my pace. Mm. And I would ask everybody watching this is what's controlling your pace? Is it scarcity? Is it comparison? Mm. Is that guiding your life? And I can promise you if that's guiding your life, you're going to be burnt out because you're running at a pace that you're not meant to run at. And so I've had to say, okay, I'm going to have my pace be controlled with peace. Mm. I'm going to have my pace be controlled with trust. And trust is I know I'm doing the proper things, even if I can't see the external validation or external alignment. I know at some point the finish line will come from my, will come for me. And so that's been really, really huge mm. because we have so many people in this world, and I think social media 
is a big part is that we're living in comparison. Right. You see somebody, oh, I should have what Trent have. I'm in year 15. <laughs> you know, you're just starting out. And so that's why I tell people, I don't tell people my year 15, hey, this is what it was when I first started out. But if you're trying to do what everybody else is doing and you're going to feel burnt out, you're not getting those results, you're going to say, oh, this is not for me. And then you go on to the next thing, and the next thing. And I call those people, and I've been this person too, so I'm not judging, but I call them uh, disloyal gardeners. Mm. They're not actually cultivating and watering the seed and taking care of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. They don't see the growth, which a gardener's mindset should tell you that growth is taking place even though I can't see it growing. Absolutely. They don't see the growth, so they go to the next seed, then the next seed, then the next seed. You should have a full garden of seeds that are undeveloped. I read this thing uh, recently, actually, and it said that um, studies have shown, I don't know what studies they are, so don't quote me exactly, but that the greatest, most successful people have the ability to have delayed gratification. Oh, yeah. That's it. That is like the key. And and you know what's so, I it was one of those things that I needed to hear because I have a tendency to be very impatient. Um, I get overwhelmed and I'm just like, I, I because I'm a very visionary person, I can see the vision and I'm in a hurry to get to it. And I've had to really learn, slow down. No more information so you don't get analysis paralysis, yeah. right? <laughs> like take a thing, learn the thing, execute the thing before you move on to the next thing, but really just delay the gratification because the time is gonna pass if regardless of what you do. So why not take the steps? There's so much information out there that every step you can get information before you go on to the next thing. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because that's the thing. That is the thing, delaying your gratification. My question to you about the boundaries. Mm -hmm. I know how important boundaries are. Yep. But here's the thing when I find that some people, and, I, and I'm just curious to see if you find this too, is that when you're telling people this, there are certain people who will create boundaries when they're the ones who people need to create boundaries from. They think that everything else is the problem. So they create these hard lines in the stand that are not healthy boundaries. So how does someone say, okay, I know I need to create boundaries, but how do I make them healthy as opposed to like the disconnect thing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I don't, I, I don't want to completely disconnect where I'm not in community with people. How do they make it where these, these tools, these principles are actually done in a healthy way? People who are doing that have to find boundaries wrong. Boundaries are not walls to mm, keep things out. Right there. I love that. Yes. They're bridges to let the right things in. Mm, I love that. They're bridges. They're only a wall when somebody keeps disrespecting you and they build the wall themselves. But they're not walls. So you're not there to keep everything out your life. That's a lonely, miserable life. But what's the bridge that you need to build mm. to get to what you want for life? So if you say, I need peace, what's the boundary I need to set with myself or with other people? to give me peace. If mm -hmm. I say I want a better relationship, what's the boundary we need to set to make that relationship mm -hmm. better? So boundaries aren't some ugly thing. Boundaries are truly beautiful in friendships and relationships and partnerships if you start to see boundaries for what they really are. Yeah, I so agree with that. I'm so glad you said that because that is the thing. And I and um, I again, I hear it all the time. It's like, well, I love that. I, it's not a wall, it's no. a boundary. And there should be some, reciprocation in it it should create a beautiful flow in your life because setting boundaries also creates healthy relationship for you and another person sometimes you setting the boundaries helpful to the other person right. who needed the boundary set <laughs> Absolutely. you know so okay so i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you so you've got those two what was the uh, the other ones i didn't mean to interrupt you the third one and protect your energy is demand your worth Ooh. so Ooh. i was going with know your worth but it's unapologetic so demand your worth and that's an area every area of your life um, I feel like when you don't demand your worth, you have a great tendency to settle. Mm. And I believe settling leads to suffering. 100%. From every area. And so I've been very unapologetic this year with demanding my worth, even when people don't see it. I don't mm. let people put their price tag on me. I don't let people say, oh, you're worth this. Companies are, even me as a speaker. Some people, oh, you charge too much. Well, that's my price. Right. And. I'm unapologetic about it because I know how much free stuff and how much I do to give back. Uh, also, with demanding your worth, it's a journey I take people on about understanding worth. Most people in the world, I would say, foundation of pain goes to this, this, this saying, this truth, I'm not enough. Mm. Everything goes down to that foundation. I'm not enough. And what's crazy, I did a... 32 city tour in like 2018. And I asked all my audience and I probably had maybe three people out of thousands. I said, does anybody in this room feel like they're not enough? And majority of hands raised. Mm. I said, has anybody in this room ever felt like 
they never been enough. Everybody raised their hand. So I have a question. What's your definition of enough? And nobody knew. Mm. So That's you powerful. are comparing your life to something that doesn't even exist or for you, it might be a perfection. Wow. And so a lot of us said, I'm not enough. Okay. What's enough. And nobody really knows. And so when it comes to worth and I talk about in this, in this principle is like, what is your worth connected to? Mm. Most times our worth is connected to things outside of us, to external, how people feel about us, our job, our bank account, et cetera, et cetera. And those are the puppet masters pulling the strings on your emotions and how you feel. Absolutely. So when things are going right on the algorithm, I feel great. I feel worthy. When I'm not getting the views, uh, I must be doing something wrong. Mm. And that is a perfect recipe to burnout, a perfect recipe to not appreciate the gifts that you've been given, mm -hmm. and a perfect recipe, I feel like, to start hating yourself and not loving yourself. Mm. Wow. So what is your worth attached to? I would ask the listener that. And for me, I had to put in something permanent, and that's my faith. I was given worth before birth. Mm. God says in Scripture, he's already set us apart, so I'm going to just hold on to that because that's permanent. The world had changed. People a view me a change, people's idea of me a change. You know, when I was playing NFL, I had all the worth to a lot of people. Once that left, I became worthless to mm. those. So attaching your worth to something that's permanent or more permanent, I think is vital to your emotional health. I love what you said too, because I feel like that's the one thing that I, I recognize, even for myself at times in my life, is how do we define things? And often finding that we actually have no definition of those things. So it just runs amok in our lives. It becomes whatever it is. Yeah. I heard this thing recently um, where this guy had said, you know, life is, is meaningless. And at first I was kind of taken aback by what he was saying. And he goes, well, what I mean by that is that it exists regardless, right? So it has no meaning. But what happens in your life is what you attach meaning to. Yeah. And so that's how life becomes meaningful. But it's just through your lens. And so I started thinking, like, wow, that's so deep. That's so simple, but so deep. And that goes to how you see yourself and the meaning you give to yourself. And you're exactly right when you say that a lot of people live their lives in an unworthy space and they haven't even taken the time to define what that actually means to really see that they are of worth. Absolutely. You know, that's beautiful. Okay, what are the other principles? This is good stuff. So that's protect your energy, those three. Okay. Then we move to protect your mind. And protect your mind, um, principle number one in that area is guard your focus. Mm. And guarding your focus is simply that, like, I'll even take it from this standpoint. Not allowing your focus to get stuck in the moment of what's going on. Mm. Um, in sports, we say next play mentality. In life, I say next moment mentality. Mm. Don't allow a moment to go past its expiration date. How many of us are carrying things in our past from 10 years ago that's controlling us now? Yeah. So what you focus on is what you feel. What you feel is what you do. What you do is what you get. Mm. So if you don't like what you're getting with your life, it all goes back down to what you're focusing on. So you have to guard that. Um, the next principle in protecting your mind is trust your vision. So we talked about that. Mm -hmm. And how I would, I'll ask you this. Have you ever wore somebody else's glasses? Yes. Like prescription? Yes. What happened when you put them on? I can't see anything. I got to like squint and wait till it like focuses. And then it's like either too much or finally I can see something. But yeah, it's hard to see through their glasses. Have you ever said like, oh, you're blind, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I had that situation happen a few times, obviously in my life. And I teach people this, you know, I believe that we've each been given a prescription by mm, God. I love that. And that prescription is our vision. But what most of us do, when we get an idea, we get some excitement. We go to the people closest to us. Mm. And we validation. say, hey, look. Yeah. Look what I see. Mm. Yep. Put these glasses on. They look through your perspective and they say, what? This is not clear. Like, you going to do that? You? And True. then what happens is you take your glasses back. And instead of putting your glasses back on, saying, oh, they're not meant to see it. It's not their prescription. You don't put your glasses back on. You put your glass in your pocket. Mm. And you live the rest of your life unclear, not being able to see, not being able to do. So I tell everybody right now, like, what are your lenses that you mm -hmm. have on? And I talk about three lenses, even the ones that you put on. Some of us have our past lenses on. So we're looking at life through that perspective right. that's saying, I'm not good enough, so why should I go anything? 
go go do anything. I have too much shame. I made too many mistakes in my past. So you're looking at life through that. Right. The second set is the pleasing lenses. It's like, who do I have to be to please the people around me? Right. As I call professional people pleaser. Oh my goodness. That's a big one. That's oh, a yeah. big one. So many people are, uh, they're paralyzed by that. Just they're so external and they want everybody they're getting ready to get ready. They want to make sure everybody's in alignment with it before they make, take the next the next action. That's so true. Yeah, I got a spoken word, and the first line is, the first step to being unhappy is trying to please everyone else. Because mm. you're never going to be able to. I don't know. It's that's, an impossibility. That's mission impossible. Yeah. I think about some of the greatest people who've ever lived and lived their lives with such big, big purpose and really about people and they were assassinated or, you know, I mean, Jesus was, the, I always tell people, yeah. Jesus was the most perfect man and he was crucified. They even hated Jesus. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm like, he had 12 friends and one betrayed him and he was Jesus. So what do you, what do you, who are you? Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's interesting you say that, but I, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, but it's just good. Like I'm, it's so thought provoking. And you. I think it's the things that it's those little things. It's those little nuggets, right? It, you're, you're a farmer in someone's field. You know, and I think that that is not just the soil, but who is there to, to, you know, need the soil or whatever the term is at farmers, but you got to have your farmers too. And what you're doing and what you're sending out there is, is like, you're that farmer that everybody needs to say, I have these tools and this is the soil and this is where we, how you need to plant it. And this is the rain that needs to pour. And you're just, you're that, that person in so many people's lives and I think it's it's just it's beautiful and it's um it's inspi inspirational. I know you probably hear that all the time, but um it just means a lot. It's very Thank meaningful, you. very meaningful. All right, so that was number five. Yeah, there's four more. And to, to, I might just because uh, I'm bad at this. So I, the other lens is the power lenses. Okay, right? yes, just, I'm sorry. just yes. living in your power, mm. and that's the lenses you need to have on and owning that. Um, so that is trust your vision. So the last principle in um, protecting your mind is shift your perspective. Okay. And so if I can give myself a title, it would be a perspective coach. Like I love perspective. Mm. And I always ask this question, your perspective is one of two things, your prison or your power. Mm. And so love if you're that. listening to this right now, or your listeners are always saying, Oh, easier said than done. Like that's the number one excuse I get. I used to use that excuse and I hate it. I hate to use the word hate, but I hate it because it's like every, everything in the world is easier said than done. Right. But you do it because you feel like you have to do it. Right. And so um, that power perspective says, yeah, this is hard, but no matter what, I'm going to get it done. And how you shift from prison to power, this is just a tactical thing that's really helped me. And it's so simple. But when something happens to us, usually we default to say, what does this mean? Mm. So when I got cut from the NFL, what does this mean? Right. My life is over. When my mother passed, what does this mean? Uh, I don't have a mom no more. And though that meaning may be true, how does that serve my soul? Mm. It doesn't. And so what I've taught people is to say, instead of saying, what does this mean? Say, what is this going to mean? Mm. And that simple adage of words now puts the power in your hands to determine the meaning. And you say, you know what? This is going to mean that, yeah, football's over. I lost my dream, but I want to walk into my purpose. Mm. Yeah, my mother's no longer here, but I gained an angel that got my back forever. And you create the empowering meaning. Stop mm -hmm. allowing your past, your, your experience of life to make you come up with a meaning that doesn't serve you. So what is this going to mean to you? And it means you take ownership and you take the responsibility. I call it the gift of responsibility. Everybody wants to live in the blame and complain mindset and put it on everything else and everybody else. No, point the thumb at yourself and say, it's on me. Right. I'm going to take this situation. It's so empowering when you do that. You get your power back. Um, it's... It, it, I, I've never articulated it that way, but as you're saying this stuff, it reminds me of when my dad passed, right? And again, he took his life. I was 10 years old, and when it happened, um, I was at a, the weekend before, I went to the park with him, right? And he used to pull the swing up over my head and run underneath the swing. And I came back too fast, and I kicked him, and he went flying, right? And he was a big guy. And I remember he was like, oh, you got me good, you know. And I was like, oh, daddy, I'm so sorry, whatever. And he just kind of laughed about it. But it was weird because that weekend, I'd, I'd have, he was like, I'd have him on the week as my mom and him were separated. But on that weekend, um, I had a dream that he passed away. Mm -hmm. And so as he's driving me home, I tell him, daddy, I had a dream about you that you died. 
And he laughed and he said, you're going to be beautiful when you get older and I'm not going anywhere. I got to beat up all the guys, you know. And that was the last kind of conversation we had. And by the next weekend, he had taken his life. Now, from a 10-year-old's perspective, I thought because I kicked him on the swing and because I told him of the dream that he didn't think I wanted him. And so there was this shame and guilt that I carried. And then also there was this feeling of like, why wasn't I enough? And that was what a little girl told herself. But the little girl grew up and that story slowly started to fade, but I didn't know it had become rooted in me. And I would go through life making poor choices, having bad relationships, just going through stuff and not really being able to put a finger on it. And through work and doing stuff, there was this moment where I was like, the 10 year old doesn't think she's enough. So everything I'm attracting into my life at this point is solidifying that. It's, it's making her believable in the story. And I had to change the narrative to what you're saying. At some point, I had to stop seeing myself as the victim of not being enough. And I had to tell the story different about my dad and say, why didn't he think he was enough mm. for me? And so I had to turn and rewire my worth in that way. And I'm using your words because I never put it, I never thought of it that yeah. way. And it's so, like I said, you just have this way of like simplifying and making it tangible that I'm like, that's exactly what I did. But when I did that, things shifted radically for me because the narrative was different and this worthiness came on from a place that was unworthy for the long time. The little, I had to tell the little girl, like, look, we can kick it. I'm gonna carry you wherever we go. Every time you have a little, you know, setback, I'm gonna be there to talk to you, but you're enough. And I had to tell her the things that I needed somebody to say to me at that time. Yeah. And my mom wasn't capable of doing it at the time because she was going through her own grief. So I think that, that you, you sharing that and me, not knowing, not being able to articulate the way you have, but by you saying that, just reminding me of that, it's, it's powerful. Yeah. And I'm so glad you have that in there because I think that will, just that principle alone will transform so many people. Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh my goodness, so what are the other ones? There's more. So yeah, so that's- I don't mean to keep interrupting Oh you. no, you're fine. But, this is a conversation, yeah. I love it. Um, so that was protect your mind. So then you shift into protect your soul. This mm -hmm. is probably my favorite part of the book. And the first principle is simplify happiness. And um, how do you do that? Yeah. So I learned from my little girl. Um, and if you look at kids, I believe that's why God tells us to be childlike. I feel as we mm. get older, we get hardened and we stop enjoying the beautiful blessings. We stop having fun. We get boring. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, actually in the book you'll read it, it says morning Marley. That's the section. <laughs> and she comes in our room like every other kid. But this particular morning, she's singing a song like it's morning time and she lets up our blinds. And I'm first I'm agitated. I'm like, I'm tired. But I thought about it for a second. I said, this little girl is just happy that it's morning. Mm -hmm. And then she goes and brushes her teeth and she's just happy to brush her teeth. Mm -hmm. And I sat with it for a moment. I said, man, when do we start making happiness so complicated? Mm. And a lot of us, we have a huge checklist to be happy. So true. Right. My social media got to be right. The line at Starbucks has to be short, right? <laughs> the list goes on to be happy. And no wonder why we're not happy. It's right. mission impossible. So how can we simplify it and really hack our happiness that we have no choice to be happy? Mm. And I know it seems like super motivational, like, you know, be grateful, you know, that, you're, that you woke up today. But when but you yeah. have some people not wake up, you realize how important that is to right. have a roof over your head. And so I literally have found happiness in the smallest things. Mm. I'm on an airplane. Like, I remember when I had dreams of being able to travel and do what I do. And so how can you simplify happiness? Uh, that's a big part of really uh, bringing what I call like soul momentum mm. and which helps you as we know, momentum is like the visible force in sports, but it really helps you live more in your power and your peace. Um, the next principle is align internally. Oh, so this is big. So people always ask, Trent, how do you say yes to certain things? Outside of my principles, it's just something inside of me, discernment. You can say intuition mm -hmm. that says yes, and I listen to it. Do you think that that's powerful for you because you're more grounded in yourself with your worth? Do you think that that, it starts to, that silence gets louder when you get more grounded? Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think your soul speaks all the time. We just don't listen. We don't listen. And yeah. I remember in high school, you know, 
it was a situation I was at a party and literally my internal alignment said leave. And I left. And that party got shot up. Wow. And so I listen now to that. And that's the thing, you know, Trent, like, I feel like people don't realize that they all have it because we've yeah. all had moments where you just had this weird feeling and you, you can't quite, it wasn't like a thought, then a feeling. It was a feeling, then a thought. And I think that when people are not sure, it's like, well, what came first? That's why I tell people, what came first? Did you think it, then feel it? Or did you feel it, then think it? Yeah. Because if it started here, you need to be steadfast and listen to that. And and I, I just love it. Sorry, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you finish telling your stuff because I well, no, there's no, so you're, many you're different fine. things. You're I just fine. love it because it's, I can't wait to read the book because I know you're giving cliff notes here, but I mean, it's just, this is so power. This is the kind of stuff that you don't read it once. You go back and you reference and you go back and you yeah. reference because it's going to, each principle, each one of these things are going to speak to you differently at different times. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like, okay, I need, I need this, uh, protecting my soul and this, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, continue, please, please. Well, even sticking with an internal alignment, like a lot of people, and I've been here in my life where, it's the external alignment that tells us what's right. Mm. So it's everything outside of us has to add up for us to take action. For me to start the dream, everything has to line up. Or for me to do certain, okay, it has to align. For me to take the opportunity, uh, it has to line up. And there's times where I trusted my external alignment and it put me in bad situations. Mm. And so I've learned to say, forget the external. What is your knowing saying mm. right now? Yes. Deep down inside you. And sometimes I make the mistake of not listening. And every time I slap myself in the face, say, yep, you should have listened. Mm -hmm. um, and the last principle, which is probably my favorite, is living fulfillment. And, and how do you do that? Yeah. yeah. So I have a process called the art of fulfillment. And the best way I can I have time to tell a quick story. Yeah, of course. I mean, so you know yeah. <laughs> so I was, uh, and I'll make it quick. I was speaking in Vegas, actually, <laughs> at, at Caesars Palace. Uh, I had, a, they had an event that was a real estate event. I was speaking. And it was a lot of wealthy people. Like, I'm talking about, you know, wealthy, wealthy people in real estate, some of the best in the world. And I got to talking about fulfillment and what truly matters. Mm. And I noticed a guy to my left, I could see it in his face. Like, he was empty. Mm. And I said, is anybody in here dealing with anything? And I look at him, he look at me, I say, hey, man, like, what's going on? And he opened up, and I'll make this story short. He said, um, I'm not happy. Mm. And I don't have peace in my life. I said, why? He said, I said, well, you know, are you successful? Said, Absolutely. Like, work is great. Everything is good. But I don't have a relationship with my daughter. Wow. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, I get her everything. She has a G-Wagon. I buy everything. And I said, stop for a second. Because when it gets to parenting, I get very, very, I just get serious on that. Because I don't want people to be a success to the world, but a failure to theirs. Yeah. That part. I don't want to walk through my house and everybody loves Trent Shelton, but my kids can't stand me. Right. Like that's powerful what you just said. That that will that's a non-negotiable for me. And um I asked him, I said, okay, on a scale from one to five, how much do you love your daughter? Five. It was a six, ten. If it was on the scale, of course, five. I said, on a scale from one to five, how much time are you spending with your daughter? Mm. Maybe a one. And I said, no, no wonder why you're not fulfilled, bro. I said, fulfillment works off of doing what you love with who you love. Mm. Time divided by what matters most will equal fulfillment. Absolutely. And I said, no matter what you buy her, no matter what you get her, she wants a relationship she with her dad. Time. She wants your presence and time. Yeah. And I said, do you have to work? Because there's seasons where you got to, right? right? There's seasons where you're making sacrifices. So I don't want anybody to feel guilty for having to go through those seasons. I had to go through those seasons. Right. I said, no, I don't have to. I'm set for life. So I said, you need to sit at home and change your priorities and realize that you're going to have a life full of regret. And regret is the greatest poison to the soul because you can't do anything about can't it. can't change it. And so yeah. he took from that and um, actually stayed in touch when he made those changes. Wow. That's so incredible. Everything you say reminds me of something, I swear. I remember a moment in my life where, again, I was a single mother and I was going to school and I was working two jobs to try to make ends meet. And I just felt like I was completely and utterly failing as a mother because I needed to do these things in order to support us. But I just, I felt like I wasn't there enough in his life. And I remember 
there was this uh, radio station, uh, 90.5, and it was this yeah. guy named Jack France, and he would go, praise in the Lord. And he was, um, it was this Christian radio station I used to love to listen to. And, um, and he said this one thing, and I swear, it's like God always knows when to speak, right? And, it, and he said, for parents out there who are not able to give all their time to their children, remember that they'll, they'll remember most the quality versus the quantity. Yeah. And in that moment, I said, you know, when I do have time with my son, I'm sleeping or I'm exhausted. And because I'm exhausted, maybe I'm, you know, not, don't have the best attitude or whatever. And in that moment, I said, I'm going to give him everything I got in every moment that I got until I can figure this thing out or I can give him more time. Right. And, um, and that's what I did. I mean, I made sure that the time we had was, the, was as much quality as I could possibly give him because you're exactly right. It, it wouldn't matter all of the things that I could tangibly give to him if he didn't have that quality with his mom yeah. where I could teach him things and give him life stories and all of that. And it, and it really helped me and it changed so much for me. So I, you were there for, for that man to hear that story, Yeah, you know? Wow. You're so, um, do you realize, do you demand your worth and realize how amazing these things that you are giving in people's lives? I mean, there's people that you'll never know how much you are impacting them. And yeah. how does that, how does that, is that a lot of pressure for you? Does that like overwhelm you sometimes or do you not really think about it? It's hard because I don't see me how a lot of people in the world see mm. me. And so when people are, and I'm appreciative of it, but I'm just like, I'm just sharing my heart. And even though I know it's special, at the same time, I'm like, I'm not doing anything special except sharing my heart. And so mm. for so long, I tried to understand it. Like, why me? Like, why are people like grabbing onto my work? Why me? And I never could understand it. And so I just learned to just trust and let go. Mm. Like, I'm not trying to understand it no more. The however, power of surrender. Yeah. However, God wants to use me in whatever way. And, you know, I don't, I always give God the credit because it's not me. That's, that's doing these things as far as like helping people. I'm just a vessel. That's yeah. always say I'm not a life changer. Like people say, you changed my life. No, I'm a seed planter. No way I can change your life because I can tell you a million things. And until you want to change, you're not going to change. Mm. I'm just a messenger and a seed planter. And so that's been very important in my journey. Um, grandmother used to always say, when they try to put your head in the clouds, keep your feet on the ground. Mm. So that's my way of keeping my feet on the ground is just like giving the credit to the most high. Yeah, I love that. You are a farmer. Yeah, you're I help, like that. You're helping people cultivate for sure <laughs> so they can have their harvest. It goes with my overalls too, right? I love in it, my yeah. Texas, in my farmer Texas, in the yeah. Dale. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we go, if you have a little bit of time, yeah. I have a few like just deep questions to ask you. And then we'll close with where people can pre-order your book. I've already pre-ordered mine. Okay. Uh, the book comes out March 5th. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh the, the protecting your peace yep. and it's the nine, what is the unapologetic principles? Principles. To, to yes. Thrive in a chaotic world. So um, we'll talk about that. So these quick rapid questions really quick before we close. And sure. I really appreciate your time. I know we went a little bit oh, over, you're fine. but I appreciate you. All right. So I'm, you know, trying to soak it all yeah. in as much as I can. All right. When was the last time that someone actually checked in with you? Because I, as for someone like you, you're always checking in. Mm-hmm indirectly or directly and so i think when you're so motivational and you have so many powerful things to say i would assume that sometimes people forget to check in with you so when was the last time someone checked in with you i would say the other today that's my team but outside of my team uh, maybe a few weeks ago or something. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to start checking in with you. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, I mean, you know, like you said, like who checks on a strong friend? And I have people from time to time, but it's yeah. it's rare. It sure. is, right? Yeah. I um, For me, because I've always, I always put on this brave face and I'm always at that rock for everybody. I kind of trained, my, that was my suit of armor. And I remember there was a time in my life when I started realizing, you know, God, no one has asked me if I'm okay. And it was a time when I wasn't. Yeah. And I said, oh, I taught them that. I taught people not to check in and I didn't realize I was doing it. All right. My next question is what's the one thing that you do? You've got these principles, but what's the one number one thing is your go-to to protect your peace? 
nature. Ah, uh, nature. A thousand percent. Trail runs in nature. When I couldn't run, it was trail walks, but nature for sure. Okay. I like that. That's yeah. my thing too. Yeah. I love, I am a park walking. I need, need some tree or something. Okay. What has been the greatest lesson for your life at this point? Mm. Uh, nothing stays the same. Mm. So embrace change. And sometimes you have to create um, a better or a new version of yourself. Mm, love that. Love that. And my last question. What would you tell your younger self if you knew he would listen? And would it make a difference in his life? Speak up and give your gift to the world. Mm. And you're doing that. Yeah. That's what I would tell my younger self, for sure. Well, Trent, I appreciate you so much in so many ways. I just think you are, um, when I, you know, meeting you, you're just so humble and just so like, you're very comfortable. It's very easy to talk to you. So what you see out there is what you get here. You know what I mean? And I just... I mean, I'm, you're just a, an amazing, powerful tool for a lot of people. Thank you. And I love the way you uh, give with your heart and leave with your heart. It is so evident. And when you speak, it is so evident in what you write. It's so evident when you're interviewing. It doesn't matter who you're around. You're just you in such a, such a powerful, magnetic way. So I appreciate you. Thank you. So much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing to keep impacting the world. Thank you. I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> so where can they find your book? How can they pre-order your book? Yeah. Um, uh, tell them about it. Take them, take them away. Yeah, uh, TrentShelton.com. That's the easiest place uh, to pre-order it. If you pre-order um, before, obviously March 5th, there's a lot of bonuses that we're giving away. Uh, one's a stay at the Protect Your Peace cabin. So uh, there's some incentives for you to pre-order. And it helps me as an author, too. Um, if not, the book comes out mar uh, March 5th, and all my socials are just at Trent Shelton. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching another episode of the Lorraine Lindsay podcast. I hope that it has been as inspirational for you as it has been for me. Do not forget to hit the subscription button. And until next time, ciao.